Good evening. A very warm welcome uh, to the General Society. And I feel like at every recent lecture, I'm thanking the audience for coming out on a wet night. So thank you so much for doing that again. It's really, uh, really wonderful that uh, you can be here this evening because this is a special evening. Um, Welcome to the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York. I am Karen Taylor, uh, Program Director. This program is supported in part by public funds from the New York City Council, sorry, from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council. And for those of you who this may be uh, your first visit, um, a little background on the General Society. Uh, we, the Society was founded in 1785 by 22 skilled craftsmen. These included uh, a silversmith, a saddler, tailor, blacksmith, and really reflected the profusion of occupations at that time. Today, our 233-year-old organization continues to serve the people of the city of New York through our educational and cultural programs. These include our tuition-free Mechanics Institute, our Locke Museum, uh, the John M. Mossman Locke Museum, and I'm pointing in that direction. For those of you, this may be your first visit. Please feel free after tonight's program to visit the Locke Museum. Um, our General Society Library, and our nearly 200-year-old lecture series, of which, of course, tonight's lecture is part of. You will find additional information about the General Society and the Library on the registration table at the front. As I mentioned, we have a really special program tonight, and I'm so pleased that it heralds the return of Phil Coppola and Jeremy Workman, who we were fortunate enough to have speak here several years ago when Jeremy screened his film, One Track Mind, a documentary about Phil Coppola. I also want to welcome Ezra Bookstein to the General Society. For 40 years, uh, Philip Ashforth Coppola has painstakingly documented the New York City subway in a series of extraordinary pen and ink drawings, meticulously de detailing the type typography, uh, terracotta mosaics, and tile patterns that millions of writers see every day, but rarely notice. Editors Ezra and Jeremy have drawn from the 2,000 pages of Phil sketches to create one track mind, drawing the New York subway. And of course, I, I want to mention that this wonderful book is for, available for purchase this evening. I also want to mention, because we are one of the fortunate beneficiaries of having um, the longer version of One Track Mind, which is entitled Silver Connections, as part of our library, thanks to Phil's generosity. So that is, yes. So that is also available to browse, but not for not for purchasing, very important to mention that. It is only available to browse this evening. Um, Philip Ashforth Coppola's drawings have been featured in the New York Times, Hyperallergic, and on the BBC. They are included in the New York Transit Museum's collection. Ezra Bookstein is a filmmaker, producer, and sculptor, and the editor of The Smith Tapes, lost interviews with rock stars and icons. And as I mentioned earlier, Jeremy Workman is a New York-based filmmaker and who directed One Track Mind, a, a documentary about Phil. Jeremy's latest documentary is The World Before Your Feet. It is now my great pleasure to introduce to you Philip, Jeremy, and Ezra. Thank you. Good evening. Thanks for being here. Um, not too damp and seedy, but it's still good. Uh, we're going to show something for you now for um, a little entertainment, and then we'll take a look at some images. 
and uh, there'll be some commentary interspersed along the course of the evening. So, should we begin? Um, yeah, we'll set that up. Okay, great. Fine. Yeah, this is a, uh, what we're going to play quickly is just a four-minute short film that Ezra and I put together um, in conjunction with the Transit Museum's uh, exhibit of Phil's artwork, which is up now at the Grand Central Terminal there in the Transit Museum's annex space, which is in this um, great little gallery space at the back of Grand Central Terminal. And there's a four minute um, short documentary that is part of the exhibit that we're gonna play for you now and then we'll sort of launch into our slideshow from there. Just hit play. Four minutes isn't too long, so hopefully you won't be too bored. <laughs> Not this. Yep. This is the 30 minute. Here we go. We don't want to bore you too much. I just got hooked on it. It started out with my father telling me the, the, down in the subway, which was an odd idea to me about underground trains in the first place, uh, there were pictures on the walls, which is another odd idea. Why would there be pictures on the walls underground in, in, in a subway, in, in a train tunnel? And uh, they showed scenes of New York from years ago. I eventually I decided, well, it'd be interesting to go and look at this, to go look at the subway, see what's there, draw the pictures, tell the stories, and uh, wrap it up. I'm Philip Ashworth Coppola, and uh, happy to be a subway recorder. I've been working on my project since 1978, so almost 40 years now, and I'm still, <laughs> still going on it. I'd like to finish it um, sometime within my lifetime. I've got about 100 stations covered out of 470, so I have ways to go. I, of course, have a day job. Mostly Saturdays, I go to the subway or to the library to research. Um, and I work in the evenings, I work Sunday afternoons, uh, either writing or drawing um, to get this all down. It's a big project, but it's a mission out of necessity because the stations uh, have been re reconfigured in the past. And sometimes when people overdo things, they, uh, they lose the original decor. It's, and if I don't catch it now, it's going to be gone and there'll be no record of it. I stake myself out in August of 78 to ask people, are you aware of, the, of subway uh, decor? And some people didn't know what I was talking about. The, what I'm talking about is the original decor where the walls were embellished to make the place look pleasant and comfortable and, and welcoming because the idea of going into a subway to New Yorkers in 1900 who never had a subway in their life before, it seemed strange. So they put up mosaics, they put up nice signs to make the place look aesthetically appealing. started and I'm, I've sort of committed to it I want to finish it too so the rest of my days I guess I'll be doing this
so we are going to do a slideshow which features portions from the book and we're going to uh, do a little bit of a read along and certainly Phil will probably color in uh, details as we go through some of the, from some of the sections. Um, yeah. you want to, Phil, you want to jump in? I wanted to add yeah. one thing that uh, the book, so um, th where the book came from, so as you saw, Phil has written this incredible encyclopedia which is on display in the back called Silver Connections, which is at this point hundreds and hundreds of pages. Mm -hmm. And um, Ezra and I basically took Silver Connections and went through it and we went through all the incredible artwork in it and started to find um, sort of a, a little bit of a story that we then compressed and compiled to make One Track Mine. Um, one thing I was going to add, it's you know especially cool for us to be here because uh, the General Society actually has a thank you um, in the book that you can find it in the acknowledgments. Um, so we were really appreciative of being involved with them um, all this time. You guys can all hear me, right? I usually talk pretty loud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, this is going to be our slideshow, and we, we can sort of drill in from here. We, we have a number of uh, illustrations and some, some, some we want to talk about, but if, if there are any pressing questions we can go there, but otherwise, let's try and hold it till we get through. Um, if there's an emergency question, well, I don't know. Okay. Like so, where the, where's the bathroom? Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, do you want to sure. read the intro? Sure. Or the start off with the subway. Whatever. Okay. Well, as a frame of reference for what we're going to show you, it. It's all about the birth of the New York subway. Everything we're, that we've been documenting through Phil's work, as Phil has been doing, is uh, about contract one and contract two. So at the time of the New York subway system's conception, as the 19th century was coming to a close, the city had a handful of privately operated, steam-powered, elevated trains. They were standalone endeavors in competition with each other, constantly going into and out of bankruptcy. The subway was to be a marvel of public transportation that would finally unite the city. Furthermore, furthermore, it would embody the ideals and monumental grandeur of America's new City Beautiful movement, which in New York would also give birth to the main public library and post office, Penn Station, and the new Grand Central Terminal. The Rapid Transit Act was signed into law in 1894 by New York Governor Roswell Flower to authorize the subway planning. The Rapid Transit Construction Company was awarded the contract for construction with William Barclay Parsons, served uh, as a chief, city's chief engineer, and August Belmont II, through his Interborough Rapid Transit Company, financed the project. These fledgling subway lines, known as the IRT, were built in successive stages. Contract one broke ground in 1900 and opened in 1904, stretching the nine miles from City Hall to West 145th Street and Broadway. Contract two began construction in 1902, opening stations in Manhattan in 1905, and Brooklyn in 1908. The architects of these lines, uh, decor, and design were Christopher Grant Lafarge and George Lewis Hines. MIT graduates whose partnership had previously won the competition to design Manhattan's Cathedral Church of St. John the Divine. They worked well together. Hines specialized in structure, Lafarge in design and decor. Because of this arrangement, uh, Lafarge took on the subway system's design elements, everything from mosaics to air vents. So, so what you can see, oh, here we go. <clears throat> okay. mm -hmm. Well, this is a tile sign. There's the uh, mezzanine at, at uh, the closed City Hall station, and of course the track level, the skylights, the three of them, and the... Um, the big bronze um, memorial plaque which was installed in the station to commemorate the beginning of the subway. Brooklyn Bridge monogram, back-to-back -back B's, and um, Canal Street, of course. And um, that's the standard one. Bleecker, Bleecker Street is, uh, is phenomenal in that all eight of its original name panels are still there. Hmm? Yes. I mean, um, every station had eight of them, four on each side. But of all the stations, this only one has retained all eight, which is um, it's a good thing. It's a beautiful um, name panel and Phil, unique also. Yes. Do you want to read, uh, read this text here, which mm -hmm. is a, a short 
you just a couple paragraphs that is extracted from Phil's Silver Connections, and it is about the Bleecker Street Faience name panels. Well, they are unique. There are no other ones like this in the whole system, and it was one of the first four, uh, the first the four, uh, one of the first four stations to get its decor put up in the night, 1902-03, and um, let's see, it's a deep blue. As you can see, like the cobalt. I call it Noxima, Noxima bottle blue. If you remember Noxima, yep, no, no one knows that name. Now the Noxima comes like this sort of pale plastic blue. It's not the same thing as the blue um, glass that was around when I was a kid, not that far. Ah, uh, yes. And then uh, here is the station and my drawing. And our favorite, our favorite Astro Place beaver, the only one in the system. Yeah, um, I'll read a little about this. Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> Surely the Astor Place Beaver plaque is the most fondly beheld of all the Subway's iconic tableau. Astor Place's namesake, John Jacob Astor, was one of the richest men in the world during his lifetime. Astor, labeled the landlord of New York, made a great fortune in real estate. But other fortunes came before, most notably when he latched onto a fashionable trend of the time, when gentlemen of quality wore beaver fur top hats. He entered into commerce with Native Americans and Canadian trappers, importing beaver pelts, and established his own trading post in, out in Oregon, which he modest, modestly named Astoria. So it was beaver pelts that earned Astor his early fortune and enabled him to start buying up Manhattan piecemeal, hence the beaver plaques to pay homage to his beginnings. And as Phil has done the research, uh, discovered that the plaques and cornice were fabricated by Gruby Fayance, which is a, um, a group in South Boston, mm -hmm. Addison, Le Botelier mm -hmm. probably guided the molding of these yeah. famous plaques. Mm -hmm. And Gruby, you may know, was famous for their vases. To have a Gruby vase in your house was to have like the pinnacle of um, both good taste and a lot of money. Um, and you, you can't hardly touch them these days. 14th Street Eagle. Oh, the Eagle, yes. Our favorite eagle, which was hidden from sight since, I don't know, when, maybe 1910 until the 1990s. It was concealed behind walls when the mezzanine was put over to shops, which, if you remember, the mezzanine at 14th Street was uh, a maze of shops and smells and noise and stuff. Um, and then they finally got recovered um, in the 1990s. And these actually stood on the um, west side, side platform. And there were only three of them on that side. And um, this was actually the ceiling. As you see right now, I'm standing in front of one. If I was, if I was on the original platform back in 1904, I would be, uh, I would be twice the, I would be twice the distance below it. But they have um, redone the station um, lately. And yes, ma'am? Yeah. Emergency, yes. I'm sorry, yes, of course, that the 456, the IRT, that's the green, um, green line. And I could also read this junk here. These eagle and escutcheon plaques adorn three stations on the IRT line, Brooklyn Bridge, 14th Street, Union Square, and 33rd Street. So why are these magisterial eagles only at these three stations? If we associate these American bald eagles and their star-studded shields with American defense and strength, then armories are the answer. The 71st Regiment Armory stood just upstairs from the 33rd Street Station, and the 42nd Street Infantry Armory was, was at Union Square. As for the Eagles at Brooklyn Bridge, it's not readily known if there had been an armory there. Unfortunately, these were covered up by a station reconstruction project in the 1960s. And they're still hidden. I haven't seen one yet. And Phil, that was something of you uh, hypothesizing, right, about the armory. That's not something that's, that's noted in any official No, text. not really. I just know that in, in the Civil War, uh, the regiments marched out from Brooklyn Bridge up or down south, I guess, to the war fields. That's a possibility. I don't know of any, any other. Um, there, are other small, uh, there are other armories, too, around which have been forgotten, but I can't say exactly why.
Which one burnt down? Over 30. Oh, yeah, the one on 33rd Street. While they were under construction, when they were building the subway in 1903, I guess, the armory caught fire not on, a, on a, a February snowy night. Amazingly, the snow was coming out like crazy, but the place burned. Uh, it was so bad they had to call in like four or five fire departments. And the fire spread to the hotel across the street, and that got on fire too that night. It was a heck of a scene. Uh, and then the, 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 the armory was rebuilt by Clinton and Russell, and only in 1970s it was pulled down. That is a high school and um, office building there now where the armory stood. So this, this is traveling sort of up the, the, these, the four, five, six, or actually the, the six, essentially. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that's uh, local. Mm -hmm. So this is... Um, we made our way to Columbus Circle. We're on, and now we're on the, uh, the uh, west side. This is the uh, number one, two, three trains, the red line. And this is uh, Columbus's ship, probably, the Caravel, the Santa Maria. Also made by Gruby. And um, most of them are still intact. Now this, this was the first station? To, oh to yeah, design. Columbus. Yeah, Columbus Circle was the find the very first station where they actually um, uh, Lafarge and Chief Engineer Parsons came together on a format for the walls, and it's the first station that Lafarge had uh, designed successfully, and it was full of faience, very expensive, and when August Belmont saw the bill, he came down on the on the on the chief engineer to go down on the architect to tell him to cut down all the expense and get things standardized and work on more mosaics and more terracotta. So they had to um, tone down the uh, the ambitions of Lafarge. That's the uh, Santa Maria. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can read this one. Mm -hmm. Uh, so this is Columbus Circle, as we said. This was actually the very first station to receive its complete design from Lafarge's drawing board, and an example of the most lavish use of faience, featuring plaques of Christopher Columbus's Santa Maria and broad molded cornices. This extravagance was not lost on August Belmont II, the subway's financier, and he again pleaded to have the architecture simplified. His injunction led to future reduction on faience and marble wainscots, and in increased reliance on mosaics and terracotta. But for all its status, this station at 59th Street was neglectfully treated when, about 30 years after it opened, a new construction project demolished many of the plaques, cornices, and name panels. Recently, the MTA office at Station Design reversed Columbus Circle's fortunes with a station facelift. The new design work is clad in terracotta in homage to Lafarge's decor with broad, flat, green cornices and plaques announcing 59 in large raised numerals. The new mosaic name panels, complete with ivy, bells, florets, and other decorative designs, are faithful to the originals. As Phil said, the original faience caravels were cast by Gruby Faience in 1902, probably in Boston. And putting a Gruby on the wall, that was like, like a Tiffany, right? I mean, it was... Yeah, yeah, Lafarge chose the top of the line for the decor for the stations. It was um, New York's great civic project to, an to announce the greatness of New York City as a, uh, a world center. And even, <laughs> and even, even down to the, to the men's room design, they, they, they wanted people to feel like they were in some kind of special place, these, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that's marble. Where, um, there we go. Hmm? Oh yeah, that's Second nice. Mm -hmm. Columbia University. It so was, this is Columbia University at mm -hmm. 116th Street on yep. the one station. Mm-hmm. This was um, Chief Engineer Parsons' alma mater. So he was sure to make it a big deal. And it, naturally, it, it, it deserved the great approach. That's, of course, the Columbia seal uh, with the, um, and this two em emblems of learning, knowledge, and uh, the lamp of um, something. Thank you. <laughs> knowledge is good. Two knowledges there, okay? Better than one. Ah, uh, yes, ceiling, uh, the ceilings were decorated with molded um, beam strips or ceiling strips. Um, okay, that's, uh, and there's... 
I could go back and read Columbia. Go on. Oh. City College. All right, well, okay. City College. Sure. City College is at 137th on the one station. Mm -hmm. um, it is likely that the first version of this stop's dec decoration, dating to 1904, had standard mosaic name tablets and the panel 137th Street in white on blue. But City College wanted its existence acknowledged in the station in the same way that Columbia University was named two stations to the south. City College filed their first petition with the Rapid Transit Commission within a year of the subway's debut, but its request was declined. City College tried again and again over the next decade until the Public Service Commission agreed to install modest placards announcing City College on the station's walls. Not satisfied with such a token response, the college resumed its efforts, and by 1920, the Transit Construction Commission agreed to a name change, though it demanded that the college fund the project itself. The college's subsequent fund drive was so successful that the 137th Street St station benefited with the installation of 12 beautiful mosaic panels resplendent in the lavender and black colors of the college. Only two of these panels are still visible today. And um, the identities and the designers of these are unknown. Mm -hmm. Where in Columbia, you could see most of them still up now. Oh, sure. Um, <clears throat> and City College, you could just see just these two, right? I think just on the, on the sort of the north station, I think. No, they're opposite each other. Yeah, that's well, right. Each, one each, on each, each side. Each platform got one yeah. saved. Another reason why I'm doing this study, because things like that happen, and we lose we lose the core and and, uh, and imagery, so that's one reason one reason why I've uh, or the main reason why I began this study. Yeah, we were really uh, Ezra and I were really taken by how many of these original um, faiences and moldings and mosaics have been covered, have have been replaced, are no longer there. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we would go to a station like South Ferry, and something would be there, and then we'd find out a couple weeks later that the faience was covered, and then we'd hear a rumor that one of them opened up again. So it's it's definitely um, a, a little bit of a, a race against the clock on some of these in some of these stations. Some are really well preserved, like as you saw with, with Columbus Circle, mm -hmm. but um, yep. mm -hmm. others are, are dangerously just, you know, um, maybe have just one or two left. Yeah, I, I, I just love how this is, want to talk this is Yeah, the, this, this is at like, well, 168th Street, the deep tunnel stations. Uh, this design was a, was a footbridge over to the, uh, the, uh, the uh, former, uh, the original elevator um, bank. And uh, there was a ceiling light above the, uh, in the arch ceiling with this, um, this, this, this sort of a, a delicate mosaic border around it. And the two uh, parts going uh, either direction, they are actually framing the lip of the opening into the ceiling which leads over. It's an architectural engineering necessity. Uh, actually, the water damage had like, pretty much reduced this to, um, it was like gone. It had, been, it had been so damaged with water damage and um, that it was like gone. And I was there recently and it was rebuilt very nicely too um, by I guess the MTA or the TA. Um, the, the, the frame around the light fixture itself is a bit different, but the, uh, you know, the, the florets and the, and the cross hatches are, have been re restored. Um, I think they replaced it with like coffee colored plain like little two by two tiles for a one time and then they restored it to this instead, which is very, um, well, uh, a credit to them. Yeah, 168 and 181st are beautiful stations on the one line. So um, if you guys are in that area, they're really beautiful. In fact, uh, the, the, the image that Ezra has up now is the 181st Street Rosette, which are these incredible little details in the wall on 181st Street. 181st also has a number of what look like sort of chandelier designs. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Well, that, that's, that's the picture of one, and then I did a drawing of it. There's a drawing. It's about the size of maybe, I don't know, maybe like a large manhole cover, and there's... Oh, bigger than that. Bigger, yeah. It's enormous. These, these are also by Gruby, and they're all faience, and they were installed. There were like eight of them per station, and from the central circle, you see that they hung um, chandeliers of some sort. I'm not sure what they looked like uh, to light the station. 
Um, these these uh, these deep tunnel stations are immense and uh, very impressive. Can you imagine the chandeliers in the subway? <laughs> well, not really. No, I'm, they may have been just like pipes and stuff with, with light bulbs. I don't know what it looked like, but um, it, it wasn't. I'm sure it wasn't crystal. I don't know, would not stand for crystal in his in his uh, deep tunnel station. And hey, as we go back to that one, I'll read about 181st Street Rosette. Yeah. Oh, Deep the under the hills of Washington Heights, 126 feet below ground, lies the 181st Street Station. There is an oversized rosette crowning the name panels, and everything seems done on a grand scale. The large mosaic band of frets and florets arches with the barrel vault, just as as it begins to curve over the, the heads of the commuters. Mm -hmm. Form was function, and all of the architectural arrange arrangements, plaques, cornices, panelings, floral designs on the walls, even the lowly air vents were meant to remind the commuters of a pleasant room, providing comfort to city folk unaccustomed to riding a train under the earth. 181st Street Station is actually not the deepest station in the system. That distinction goes to 191st Street, built in 1911, which runs 180 feet below ground. And the mosaics at 181st Street were composed by Felix Alcan and his European craftsmen in 1904. Uh, Felix Alcan was a craftsman that we ran into quite a lot when we were working with Phil and discovering all, all the mosaics in the, in the stations. Um, that was something that I think that Ezra and I, this, this point that we just read, really were taken, which was, uh, if you leave that up, was how these stations seemed um, designed almost as if it was, it was somebody's home. Um, you know, many times it was, it was um, like paneling or curtains or oriental mm -hmm. rugs or, as we saw, chandeliers. They were designs that seemed to you know, remind viewers that the going underground for a subway was actually, you know, a, a lovely thing to do. And a lovely thing and, and some, only rich people had these kind of things in their home and, you know, the wealthy were not taking the subway. So the design was also to bring this grandeur to the, you know, to the, to the common man who was for the first time underground on a metal train with thousands of people scared, you know. So. <laughs> yeah, somewhere we're in, our, in reading our, the, some of the, the, the information, somebody was, thought that it was gonna be like a roller coaster going on a subway and they, were, they didn't wanna go on it because they thought it was gonna be like a roller coaster. Ah, I'm losing my water. Okay, 125th Street. Yeah, well this is, this is, the, Lenox, this is the Lenox Avenue line. This number three train goes over to Brooklyn. And um, it was pretty, every station was designed pretty much the, the similar. They had these type of plaques with the uh, with the flowers and the uh, and the uh, the cartouche frames. And this is a mosaic rendition of the same thing in one at one forty fifth Street, which was also done in terracotta. This is a mosaic rendition of it. I could read the one twenty fifth. One twenty five. Yep. And just by the way, on the language that you're hearing and the stuff we're reading, so this is, is um, text that was, I guess, originally came from Phil that Ezra and I sort of extrapolated, rewrote, repurposed, um, but a lot of this sort of florid language where that's really um, about, um, evokes a, a, a an, an, old, an older time came from Silver Connections and we were inspired by that in our own writing. So on 125th Street terracotta plaque and cornice, the basic design of the 125th cartouche plaque is a recurring, recurring decor element featured in a good quarter of the earliest stations. Lafarge initially wanted the subway's plaques and cornices fashioned in faience, but in, so, in many instances as costs mounted, the later stations needed to be trimmed as this one is in the less costly terracotta. Lafarge's decorative wall of white tiles, mosaics, and ceramics is actually a shell, approximately a half foot thick, standing about two inches away from the rough structural wall. This was a deliberate strategy of the station's construction. Through holes in the cornice, air may flow between the structural and the finished walls of these stations. The engineers intended by this device to eliminate the destructive effects underground water pressure could have on these subterranean walls, hopefully keeping everything dry within. And these are on the two of the three station. 
and the plaques and the cornices were cast by Atlantic Terracotta Works in Staten Island in 1904. Phil, do you want to explain what the difference is between faience and terracotta and mosaics? And okay, the real person who would explain that best would be uh, like someone like Susan Tunick, who was the head of the Friends of Terracotta. Uh, in my best effort to tell you, terracotta is uh, ceramics fired uh, in a kiln at a certain degree and um, with the glaze and the colors. Now, faience, though, goes through a second process, making it more durable. I can't explain exactly how or why. Makes it more durable, and it costs more, and it's it's very great. It's very uh, it's good for the ex for exteriors to withstand weather. Terracotta wouldn't be quite so, um, you know, lucky, I guess. But um, that's it. It, it. They're both the same, but one is just like um, you know a uh, um, you know a supercharged uh, version of the of terracotta. It's faience. I guess another name. I guess a new name too. So here's an example of. Hmm? Example of cutting costs. Mm. Maybe. Why are there mosaic renditions of the faience or terracotta? Um, yeah. So be, at 145th, let me just explain what yeah, what this is. Mm -hmm. So this at 145th on the tour of the three line, you could actually see mosaics that are designed to look like um, the terracotta. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the terracotta is there also, but I chose to show it as it looks like with a mosaic rendition. It could either be a cost-cutting thing, it could be an extension was put on the station, or as time ran out and the line had it open, um, they, they, re they resorted to um, mosaic rather than order some more terracotta just to get it done quicker. There's three possibilities. Uh, uh, Fulton's Folly. Fulton's Folly. Yes, indeed. Yeah, people laughed at Fulton, Robert Fulton, and said, oh, it's never going to work. He, um, he actually had run a, a steamboat uh, like this on the River Seine in, 19, in two, th sorry. 1803. <laughs> Thank you, 1803, better. And uh, so he came to New York and later on, and the New Yorkers scoffed and said, it's not going to work. You know, you're not going to get a, a boat to be propelled through the water. We have to be, we, 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 uh, we rely on sails and wind power, as it's always been. But he, uh, he proved him wrong. He, he launched this ship and sailed up the Hudson uh, to Albany and back down again in record time, half the time that, that um, you know, uh, wind-powered uh, sail ships, sailing ships uh, took. And so he changed navigation um, dramatically. This is on the four of the five line on Fulton. Yep. And mm -hmm. as we notate here, four of these faience pl plaques survive on the west side of the station. But the east side platform, along with its faience plaques, was entirely bricked over in the 1980s. Mm. Yeah. So are there, there are four of them now. Yeah. So we could have lost some, which is, which is not, that's another sample of very bad planning. These were uh, faience plaques made by Rookwood in Cincinnati. And if there were more of them, they should not have been pulled off the wall and, and thrown away or busted. Would I, I, don't, I don't know how many were there because I never got to the station in time to look at over before the bricks arrived in 1980 or so. Yeah, I was fascinated that, it was, that they, they were made in Cincinnati. I mm -hmm. thought that was interesting. Yep. What's next? Ah. Uh, the Wall Street. So That's these a, obviously are some of the more well-known faience down mm -hmm. in Lower Manhattan. Yeah, yeah. This is also 1905. It's the cousin to the to the Fulton um, Station. Same uh, same artisans and uh, same era. And um, this is the second. This is the second line that was built for the subway, extended from Brooklyn Bridge down to South Ferry and into Brooklyn. That was, the, that was the next big push. I'll read this one. Wall Street mm -hmm. Faience. Anyone seeing this view of New Amsterdam would have been standing just outside the Dutch settlement's limits on the northern side of its fabled wall, which spanned the width of Manhattan Isle. The Dutch governor, Peter Stuyvesant, had this wall erected in about 1653 to protect the town as the British were challenging the Dutch's hold on the New World, and there was an ongoing conflict with the wet quasic Geek tribe. Indians. Close enough. Close enough. The Dutch brigade <laughs> that patrolled the interior of the wall eventually wore a path through the grass, and this dirt lane became known as Wallstraat, 
When the British attacked in 1664, they came in from the bay rather than the north, so the wall didn't help. They took possession of New Amsterdam and recrowned it New York City. And the faience plaque here was crafted again in Cincinnati at Rokewood Faience in 1905 and was possibly modeled by the craftsman John D. Wareham. Mm -hmm. And how many of these are, are still up down there? There's a bunch. Another four, so I mean, it's crazy. They're not that many. I think they're, yeah. I think, and then they're all on the west side too. I don't think there's anything on the east side. They haven't been washed in a while. <laughs> They're very dirty. I mean, and that is a, yes, an a interesting bit. aside on all this is that many of these, you know, beautiful mosaics and plaques and faience are in, are in very rough condition. And down at Wall Street, they're particularly grimy down there. Um, they look like they have not been really cleaned much at all. In 100 years? Yeah. Okay. What's next? The bowling green? Oh, yes. Okay, Bowling Green, which you can see here, you're not going to see it down there. Absolutely. In 1977, uh, the wisdom of the era decided, let's take a station and redo it from top to bottom. And they did that at Bowling Green. They put up on Bowling Green, they put a red, red brick tile all over. I don't know if these, these are probably buried behind that wall. They probably are still intact. This is the Bowling Green name panel. Nothing else like it in the system. It's unique. And um, I only was able to do this thanks to a large, a large color photo on display at the Transit Museum, because another mu a museum was doing a subway thing then, and I'm not sure which museum it was. I can't remember the name right now. It's one of the famous ones. And so I was able to see it, and I went to Bowling Green to look at it, and that's when I discovered it was not there anymore. Another reason why I um, took this sit to this to this study to preserve what we what we have or find out what we used to have and make a record of it. And that's it. South Ferry. South oh, Ferry. Yeah, well, this is also buried. Um, you know, I mean, they, they redid the station. And then what, Sandy came in and they reopened this one because the other one got flooded. And now the other one's good, so this one's buried again. So, but this was here in 1905. I'll read this. It has, Go ahead. Uh, With wind whipping sharply across New York Bay, the Battery has always been a great place to sail. The Dutch held races here in stoops, or sorry, sloops, just like the one depicted in this station's plaques. In fact, these sturdy little vessels were used to ferry people and cargo up the Hudson, monopolizing river traffic from the 1620s to nearly the 1850s when paddle boats came to dominate the waterways. These faience plaques have the deepest relief of all the system's pictorial decor. The porters hated them because so much dust settled on the sloops, hull, and sails, requiring additional cleaning. These faience plaques were fabricated in Hartford by Hartford Faience in Connecticut in 1905. The master casting was probably carved by Lewis Dettenborm's Woodworking Company, which made models for various industries in the region. And wait, Ezra, do you have the original of that again? Just to go back to it. Nope. Okay. No original? So yeah, I think none of these are visible right now. Yeah, this isn't visible. So I couldn't get they're, they're, uh, they're still there, but they just can't go to that station. Yeah, I mean, as of a couple years ago, you could see the South Ferry fans, mm -hmm. but not anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay, now to the, the gem. Okay. People ask me, what's your favorite station, Phil? And I'll tell them, it's, it, Borough Hall has to take... What's your favorite station? Oh, please. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, right. Every, every day they ask me the same question. Um, a Borough Hall, just for its magnificence and its completeness, it has to take you know, the top honors. Uh, Lafarge went to town on Borough Hall, and he uh, created decor elements all over the place. Very, even, there's even two different types of, of pilaster designs, besides the elaborate name panel, and even the, uh, even the, um, on the, um, even the, even the entrance on the north side of Fulton Street has a, has a gorgeous display, uh, which also um, is, uh, you know, holds two, two large bronze plaques, uh, just before you even get down to the station. And then we have, um, this is one, one of the, this is another type of pilaster with the, uh, with the uh, festoon and, and the plate. And then we have, 
Um, this is upstairs, I could say, in the entrance area um, on the north side of Fulton Street before you can get downstairs. There's the, um, that's the monogram um, with the, in, the, in, the, in the wreath. Um, it's, <laughs> it's, this was made by uh, Hartford Fayance also. And uh, it's just, you know, it's just amazingly noble. And I, I refer to the station almost as like something sort of a, a, a tribute to the Roman Empire. It's just like that. I'll read this just because I love some of the language in this couple of paragraphs. No, it was mostly from Phil's, again, from Phil's work, but then Ezra and I rewrote it a little bit. Editing, yeah. For this grand station, one of the jewels of the system and the IRT's first stop into Brooklyn, Lafarge fully celebrates his Beaux Arts training and the design of this signage and decor. There is noble Roman capital lettering in the two bronze plaques at entrance level, set in broad panels replete with mosaic pilasters, festoons, fruits and flowers, ribbands, and ovoids. All of which, by the way, are architectural terms. Downstairs, there are gold-rimmed plates, ribbands, cascading florals, rosettes, florets, motifs of egg and acanthus and bead and reel, consoles and the majestic BH monogram plaques mm -hmm. set within a victor's wreath of laurel leaves and berries. Only one other station, 14th Street Union Square, bore wreath plaques, but there, they were entombed behind walls around 1910. Thankfully, we could still appreciate these borough hall splendors as they have survived in full view for more than a century now. Mm -hmm. And as Phil pointed out, the BH plaques and cornice were produced by Hartford Fayance in Hartford, Connecticut in 1908. And the Dettenborn Company probably crafted the casting masters. Sounds right to me. Okay, Nevin Street. Go back to Nevin Street, please. No, the other one. The, the name panel. Oh, here's another name panel which is unique to the system. Nothing else like it. It's kind of late Lafarge. It's 1908. Um, and about the 1990s, they re uh, they, they they clean up the station. The station was kind of a, kind of a wreck, and they had a lot of structural work to do. And they on the walls they they put up new tiling and all that. But they preserved. Thank God the name panels, and there they are. You can still see them just like that. Um, at a bookstore we were at mm. a couple weeks ago, Richard Nevins came oh. to meet <laughs> Phil and had him sign um, the page, oh, this right. page on the book. He was, I believe, the great-grandson of uh, the Nevins here. I'm yeah. sure I'm sure he was, yes. A couple of and, and The lower level in Evans Street. Okay, this right here, you see this N in the cartouche frame? That is from the lower level. I snuck in there one time, luckily the door was open, and I just shot a couple of random pictures. And I came back with a, uh, a beautiful view of the Nevins plaque. And on the wall across the empty track bed, there are name panels, but not like the ones upstairs. The ones in the name panels on the, across the, the platform in the lower level, they are similar in design to the same ones you can see at Canal Street, which we saw earlier, or Spring Street. The standard, and you'll see the Atlantic Avenue also, standard um, the format with vines and bells and checks and squares and um, florets in the uh, top corners. The Nevins lower level is sort of a, a famous um, area that's now no longer accessible. Yeah, you can't get in. They have the doors well locked. One of the first things that impressed Phil about me was when I first met him and I told him that I had been um, in the abandoned subway area. Um, what is that, 108th? Or where you, where you go from 110th between 110th and 103rd and there's a station there that's now defunct. And that was... Are I'd, we talking about the, the IRT line? Yeah. The nine, maybe 91st Street? Is it? I think I thought it was higher up in the 110s. I don't no, know. You guys 90, probably have seen it. If you close. are on the one, you see this station with a lot of graffiti anyway. Yeah, it's terrible. So there are places you could get to. If you know the, if you know the right people. Yes. Right. yes. 
Okay, um, Atlantic Avenue. Um, when I read this first? Go ahead. Okay. The station is as far as the IRT's first line into Brooklyn reached. This A plaque, a typical design format found in many of the early IRT stops, features a round shield with embossed tulips flanking the station's initial. The plaque also bears a swastika fret pattern flowing to the cornice. One theory suggests that the ubiquity of tulips in much of the early subway ceramic is a reference to New York's Dutch heritage. Perhaps the faience A plaques are by Hartford faience once again, which also produced the Borough Hall wreath plaques. The mosaic renditions of these plaques were likely fabricated by the great Felix Alcan. Do you have a picture of that? Of the A? Yes. The A in um, this one? Do we have that? No, that one there. We don't? Oh, well. We don't have that one. It's, believe me, it exists. Um, there's, there's a mosaic rendition just like 145th Street. In other words, a mosaic based on the terracotta. Yes. That's in the book on mm -hmm. page 180 mm -hmm. uh, here. Okay, the Bowery. Uh, this is actually part of volume five, which has not been finished yet. Um, this is the Bowery Station. Um, that's no longer in existence. I sort of guessed at the colors, but I had a black and white photo to, to work from. Uh, it's part of the design of the entrance house, which once stood in the middle of um, Delancey Street, which was pulled down in the 1950s, I guess, or so. I don't know. Anyway, um, this is like a little, little this, is, this has not been published yet. So it's a, a preview of, of some stuff coming down the pike one of these fine days. It's in the book. It's in the book, it's in the book of course, yes. Uh huh. Oh, uh, yes. This is the Corton Street ferry boat, which you may remember. And this is another reason why I did this study, because when I got to the station in 1978, they were all being pulled out of the wall and broken up or whatever. Okay, so um, I stood there for three hours drawing it and making note of the colors. And I eventually did this drawing. This is actually drawn in um, ballpoint pen. I love the plumes of smoke coming out of the, the, mm -hmm. the smokestack. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. That was Cortland Street IRT station, which was destroyed anyway in 2001. Um, but by then it had been redone in beige glazed bricks since 1978. And now it's all gone. So, Choo Choo Train. Yep. Yes, this is the Grand, Grand Central Faience locomotive plaque. Mm -hmm. Which is, could not be less grand. <laughs> it's on the four or five or six lines. As Ezra said, it, it's not very grand now. It's very grimy. Um, here, I'll read this short paragraph. When Grand Central Terminal's subway station opened in 1918, the locomotives depicted in these plaques were not contemporary to the times. They are bell-stacked locomotives from the 1860s, referencing the trains that Cornelius Commodore Vanderbilt built into his railroad empire and subsequent opening of his Grand Central Depot in 1871. These faience plaques are probably the design work of J. Van Everend, a friend of Squire Vickers, the chief designer of the Public Service Commission and lightly, likely manufactured by the Herman Mueller Tile Company of Trenton, New Jersey. Phil, how did you find out all this information about these craftspeople and these workshops? Well, Vickers and Van Everend, they're sort of new-ish. Uh, but they're not unknown, though. Um, I, um, I just know that uh, the Vickers and, and, Lef and they never worked together. Uh, it's kind of hard you, to explain. Did you, st did you, you know... It's about the research. Yeah, like how did you find it in the research? Did you go through, through you know, books or business inventories at the time? How did you find this? The, as, uh, this is an interesting, before Phil gets to his answer, what, when Ezra and I were doing the book, um, our publishers, Princeton Architectural Press, kept on coming back to us and saying, you know, oh, we need a, we need a better bibliography. Uh, where's the bibliography? Where's all the references? And... Um, Ezra and I kept on trying to explain to them that there is no bibliography, that there's only really one source of information for all this, and that's Phil's Silver Connections, that there's really not much more in terms of a lot of this information. Compiled in one place. Yeah, at least compiled in one place, exactly. Yeah, I, um, I must have learned that, that, that Vickers was the, uh, the architect. Early on, um, it's sort of hard to trace where I found out the information, really. I know, um, well, all right. 
simply put, I met his daughter, who was alive at the time in the 1980s, and uh, we, we, so I, I, I talked to her, and she showed me some things, and I found out that Van Everen was a friend of his, and they both went to Cornell together, and, um, and Van Everen worked on, uh, he was an illustrator, and, um, and well, as a matter of fact, uh, the Whitney Museum has two paintings by Van Everen, uh, one of which was made into a, uh, a plaque for the 125th Street Station of Lexington Avenue IRT. And it shows a bridge going over the river, and it, then when it was a, a toll bridge, and it was from the 1830s, whatever. Um, as far as Miller goes, I think it's a guess. I'm not positive why I thought Miller might have done it, unless someone else had documented that it is Miller. Someone would know more than I, and it could have been Susan Tunick, or it could have been a friend of hers, I don't know exactly. But this is still open to investigation, to know more. Phil, could you talk about the, um, the different libraries and microfiche and different ways you were investigating contracts, invoices? Okay, well, the my, <laughs> okay. Uh, the New York Times, thank God, has a wonderful index, so that helped a lot. So I found a lot of articles through them. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the proceedings of the Rapid Transit Commission and also the um, Public Service Commission are open to the public. And I managed to research the books there to see what was going on and who did what. Um, the contract one line was very well documented because it was so new and so wonderful and, and a big brave move for New York City. So it was well documented who the who the who the contractors and subcontractors were. Um, I would in, uh, to find out whereabouts of people. I would go through the city directories, which were available and still are, and to see um, you know where people um, had their factories or where they lived and uh, where they when they moved here or there. I don't know what else really to tell you. It's um, and there, there there's source books all over. Uh, you just have to like sort of look into it and to find out. Libraries and libraries. Yeah. Uh, I think it's time for questions, right? Okay. Yeah. Hey. Well, be uh, before we get started, please, I would like to give a word of thanks to a few folks who um, now. I, it's, it's difficult to single out some people. Certainly I thank Karen and Victoria for inviting us here for the second time. You can you enjoy our company so much. That's, thank you very much. That's a compliment. And of course, Jeremy and Ezra, who did all the footwork and all these blood, sweat, and tears and, and uh, shoe leather and all that to get this book put together between themselves and Princeton and it was a long negotiation, and it took about a year to get it all settled down. Three PDFs later, we got the book, so there it is. There's also a wonderful foreword by the author, Jonathan Lethem, who mm -hmm. uh, was a great, great author and was really taken by Phil's story and, and wrote a great foreword in the book as well. Also, I would say Jeremy deserves a good bit of thanks, the thanks, <laughs> for um, galvanizing the Transit Museum to put up my ex the exhibit, which is there at the gallery. Yeah, which is up on screen. Yes, that's that's the exhibit right now at the uh, at the gallery of Grand Central. Um, my original drawings and even my notebooks and some artifacts from their collection, so you can see everything all together. Up until June twenty fourth. June twenty fourth, right? Now it's been said, and it's true. This little book, which is rather handy, has um, been popular with. A lot of people, so more people than ever before have heard of this thing, my project, and seen my stuff. But before this, long before this, for like the last uh, 30 years, I have had some wonderful advocates who have championed me and been my, my, um, my cheering section for all these years. I would like to thank very much Barbara Cohen, who is here tonight. Hi, Barbara. And um, her able partner, uh, Judith Stonehill, who is not here, unfortunately, just had a, um, a procedure and couldn't make it. And we have also, with Barbara, Yuki Ota, who writes marvelous reviews 
And um, it was also part of the online New York Bound Books team. So, it, it, silver connections. What about it? Okay, so um, I mean, through their bookstore, my my particular book, my books, Silver Connections, have been available to the few people who have heard of it. So it's kind of a small group, but um, I'm I am uh, I feel very uh, welcomed by all this. So I mean, and thank you all for being here, and thank you for the uh, your interest. We've got some time for questions. Uh, before we take the questions, oh. please, uh, I want to remind you that this is being video recorded, so please wait until the microphone comes to you. Oh, okay. For the whole world to see. Okay. First question is coming around. And we will be, uh, as you probably heard, we will be signing books in the back. Um, yeah. Books available in the back. We'll be doing that after the questions. So we live now in an age of regret over lost treasures. That's true. And a lot of these things have been lost by overbricking or destruction or mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. Is there any kind of protection in place for them? Some realization that these, if lost, aside from your chronicling them, are lost forever? Well, the, the Transit Museum has, has really, the Transit Museum has really recognized the um, significance and beauty of these uh, and so they put up this show uh, for Phil and where do they get the old pieces they have storage warehouse where they've been saving and keeping the climate controlled for future generations oh, thank you so, what well, one addition to that is it did take a while for the transit museum to come around with, um, on, yeah. on a lot of Phil's study um, it seemed they were less interested a few years ago and then they have become more and more interested as preservation has gotten more important. A double answer to your question, ma'am. Uh, oh, the Transit Authority and the MTA have sort of changed their philosophy or their approach or their, their view on their station decor, realizing more so these days than back in the 1970s, which is a bad time, that they have on their hands a great heritage of civic work. Also, at the time I started my study, at that time in 78 or so, the New York Landmarks Preservation Commission had, um, had uh, recognized like about 14 stations for preservation and under their protection so that people couldn't mess with them. Unfortunately, it didn't go far enough. I mean, 23rd Street is basically lost. And um, 3rd Avenue in the Bronx, that's all, that's lost also. And that's, those are two recent examples of re redoing. The good news is that on the, in Broadway, uh, on the BMT, um, that's well, whatever it is, N and R trains, um, those walls were covered in the 70s with big, big tiles and colorful, well, color, single color panels. They've been pulled away, so now we do see what had been there since 1918. Uh, the Fourth Avenue line, though, in through um, Brooklyn, had the same work done on it at the same time, and the local stations have not yet been um, recovered. Maybe they will. I don't know. It's up. You know, it's up to the MTA or the TA to decide what to do about that. Yes, sir. Thank you for your presentation. The drawings are so beautiful. Can you speak of your background? Are you a draftsman or an architect? <laughs> when I was a kid, I always liked to draw pictures anyway and, and write stories and tell stories. So I sort of have a background foundation in that. Nothing quite like this, though. Um, briefly told, uh, when I started this study, I thought I'd make a couple of cute drawings and dash them off and do a study and do an article and get it published by a magazine or something. Um, uh, that didn't happen. But the point is that I started a drawing and um, I realized, you know, this isn't... This is, I mean, I'm just doing these lines, but it's not really working out. And to my horror, I realized, my God, I had to nail myself down to counting things and using a T-square to make it real. Because, I mean, why do a drawing if it's not really going to be a good, a, a you know, a good image uh, of, the, of the actual article? So, um, 
So uh, since those days, I have uh, buckled myself down with a T-square and um, counting things and uh, all that. It's, it's all been for the good. Well, thanks so much. Yes, sir. Uh, two very quick questions. Mm -hmm. um, in your detective work, were any of the molds found? Because you can't recast from these, it'll shrink too much. So do you know of any of the foundries where the molds have been saved? And secondly, you started this project the year I started architecture school. Hmm. And in that time, um, when we were learning Beaux-Arts hand drawing and the first semester was on how to shade with a pencil, <laughs> what do you see as the future of this kind of draftsmanship by hand, this Beaux-Arts style, where everyone is impressed by CAD and computer renderings? So there, one's about the molds and one's about your artistry and the future of that kind of drawing. Okay. Unfortunately, I don't have answers, really good answer to either question. As far as molds go, I have no idea. I know that, of course, like Groovy and Rookwood and the Atlantic Terracotta and Hartford Fayance, they're all either gone or like Hartford Fayance moved on to uh, electric uh, insulators for electric wiring. Okay, so they, they did have a great program in the turn of the century, last century, for the architectural faience, but they gave it up as the growing industry for electronics with all the copper they have in Connecticut and this and that, and so they, they turned to that. As far as draftsmanship goes, I, don't, I, never went to, I did not go to architectural school. I don't know what the future looks like for that. I think it's great. I, that's sort of amazing that you were learning how to shade um, and learning the, the Beaux-Arts approach to... Um, I can't see how hand work was ever really going to go away. I just don't, I don't know. And I don't know about what you mean to CAD and is it all computer stuff, software. I don't know. I don't do much with software. <laughs> I, I'm still, I, I have a pencil and, and a pad and a pen and a, and a drawing board and a broken T-square. And that's, that's what I use. <laughs> Anyone else of interest? Wherever the mic goes, I go too. Coming around. Coming around. It's coming around. Have you been approached by other cities who uh, might be interested in having art on the walls rather than renting out posters? No, I mean I don't. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not really. I'm not. I'm not known anywhere particularly. At least maybe I will be now, but not. And um, no one uh, out, outside the city has ever approached me. And if they did, I'd have to tell them no. I can't because this thing is a lifetime project, and I'm never gonna. I just. I just couldn't give my time somewhere else. Yes, sir. Last yes, question. Down, what? We're just gonna have time for one more. One more question. Only and one. Of course, we'll be in the back, and Phil will be available to chat and. We're going to drink some wine and sign some books and I'll hang around. Any other questions? Just how, did you, how did you find the time? Would you share what your day job is and how did you find the time? This was incredibly labor intensive. Yeah, right. Well, I. <laughs> yeah, right. Now that you mentioned it, I think so too. Um, the, uh, I've always had, a, I'm, I'm, in the, I'm in the print, printing industry, so I've run print, printing presses. Even now, I'm not, I'm not retired, and uh, I would you know, do my job, and then in New Jersey. Yeah, in New Jersey, right? Yeah, and then um, on the weekends, um, I would go into uh, the, either study at the, at the New York Public Library, or go into the subway and just start taking the train, stopping and looking at stations and making drawings and and uh, and measurements and the calculations and so forth. And um, uh, one thing I did. Um, for the, uh, for the revised volume one, I went to the contract itself, the 1899 contract, to see what it had to say. And in those days then, I went, into, I went on Tuesday nights to the rare book room at the uh, public library because they were open until late. So I'd do my job, get on a train, come over into New York, and uh, study at the, at the library. Only able to use a pencil because it's a rare book room. You don't use a pen. And um, spent several weeks doing the whole contract, making notes every page, what was on the page. 
And then um, that's what I do. Night times, Saturdays, Sunday afternoons, whatever I can get done. I'm still doing that too. Fills through a hundred of the four minutes. Hundred and ten. So far. Thank you. Okay. Yes, right. Um, I want to thank you all for coming this evening. Um, if I could just ask you before you make your way to the back of the room, we're just going to make a quick presentation to our fabulous speakers. I mean, what a, what a collaboration, both tonight and on the book. Phil, there is not even words to describe the the fantastic project that you have undertaken and your exquisite work. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Jeremy and Ezra, you have made this this book possible. So I want to express our gratitude to you for that. And of course, I also want to remind you that we have silver connections here to view. I hope you will all uh, join us now um, in purchasing the book. But before we do that, a quick presentation. And to do so is Victoria Dengel, Executive Director. So, yes, thank you. And just, well, I'll be brief. Phil, we're crazy about you. We really are. This is the second time, and we love Phil, Jeremy, and Ezra. Thank you for working to bring F Phil's work to life. It really, it's, it's amazing. And as a native New Yorker, I feel so grateful that you, are, you have you know, chronicled this and, and preserved this, this piece of New York history, and hopefully it brings more attention so the, what, what we do have is preserved and, and um, is seen in its great glory. So w here we are. The General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen, founded 1785, expresses its gratitude to Philip Ashforth Coppola, Ezra Bookstein, and Jeremy Workman for One Track Mind Drawing the New York Subway for their participation in the General Society Artisan Lecture Series. So, Phil, that's for you. Me? Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. And for the group, for the group, well, and we have, and both Phil and Jeremy are, we've made you lifetime mem members. Ezra, we've made you a lifetime member of the library. So, and be, wait, and just one other thing, because we had a very, it, because um, Phil had, this was your second time here. So we've decided to give you, not that you need to be bogged down any further, but we have given you a copy, all a copy of The Lore of the Lock, which oh talks about <laughs> 370 locks and keys in such incredible detail. So <laughs> here's, when you want to change the subject, this is... <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So much. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. All right. So to our okay. audience, and thank, thank you to our audience. Um, so thank you again for coming this evening. I also want to express our thanks to Barbara Cohen. And uh, I hope you will now um, consider purchasing the book. And I'm going to ask you, because normally um, our speakers maybe take some questions over here, but we're going to go straight to the back of the room to join Edward and One Track Mind. Thank you so much for coming this evening.